Welcome to Methods in Synology. Methods in Synology is organized by Marianne Trochina of the University of Zurich and Madalena Poli of Pomona University, who I may take the opportunity to express my gratitude to for putting this extraordinary series of events together, many of which I've listened to like Spellbound in the past. Since its inception in 2021, the project has grown to by now also include as co-organizers Henry Jacobs, Marcus Haselbeck and Alice Panato. It is my great pleasure to be chairing this session. My name is Marco Pouget. Today I'm joining you from Taipei, where I'm currently visiting Academia Sinica, but usually I'm a PhD candidate at FAU Erlangen and a research fellow at LMU Munich in Germany. Mm -hmm. I'm mainly interested in the intellectual history of pre-modern Imperial China. For my PhD project, I'm working on commentarial practices from the Eastern Han period. And in the course of this, I rely a lot on the research of today's speaker who I'm thus all the more honored to introduce to you now, Michael Nylon. Professor Michael Nylon, Dai Mei Ke, has the Jane K. Sather Chair of History at the University of California at Berkeley. Having studied history at UCB and East Asian Studies at State University of New York in Buffalo, in Cambridge, and in Harvard, she obtained her PhD from Princeton University with a dissertation on Ying Shao's Feng Su Tong Yi in 1983. From there, she taught at Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, at Princeton, and since 2001 at UCB. Having witnessed and shaped much of inquiry into the fields of history, intellectual history, as well as art and archeology, span especially of the early imperial dynasties of China, I believe it is fair to say that Professor Nyland's profile has remained focused whilst also exploring the full breadth of the vast discipline of Chinese history, from studies of great oversight, all the way to deep dives into more specific phenomena. I shall thus refrain from giving you a full walkthrough of her publications, especially since she very humbly asked me to be curt. <laughs> Suffice it to highlight her most recent endeavors. An especially relevant piece of work she has conducted in relation to methodology, the focus of today's session, is Academic Silos, or What I Wish Philosophers Knew About Early History in China, which has been published as a part of the Research Handbook for Philosophy, edited by Tan So Hun in London in 2017. Recently, Michael Nyland finished a book on environmental ethics in China, past and present. Furthermore, a no doubt monumental one among her most recent contributions will be a mammoth translation of the documents classic, the Shangshu. She's now turning to a local communities in early China project, the aim of which is to produce a source book of use to those inside and outside the China field. I'm convinced these works may provide a great relief to many a learner and researcher alike. And today's lecture is likewise dedicated to alleviating some of the troubles any eager disciple of Chinese history must face. Professor Nyland will be focusing on basics needed for conducting research, such as framing the topic so as to suit your resources, as well as avoiding pitfalls of working with earlier translations. And finally, Michael Nyland will address the contentious notion of newness in research. So I'm sure there will be something new to be gained in this lecture for everyone. And thus, without further ado, let's remind Mariana to open the chat and hand over to Michael Nyland. Um, thank you so much uh, for that um, kind introduction. Um, and um, barring difficulties with uh, my screen, I'm going to move um, all of the um, people attending over to the side um, and begin with this talk. I'm honored to be uh, talking about this. And um, it's. I realized that had I been asked to do this a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have had a clue uh, what to say. So let me simply try to make my screen go down which it's not letting me do. So I'm looking everywhere, um, page down. Maybe to the side. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, great to have Mariana here. Um, uh, Marco kindly mentioned um, Academic Silos, an essay I wrote for the book on Chinese philosophy methodologies. Um, what I'd like to say most importantly is we must all cross interdisciplinary boundaries if we are to responsibly research our pre-modern subjects. 
And as far as I'm concerned, that certainly goes up through Song. Um, after that, I fall off a cliff until um, Qing, <laughs> mid-Qing, so I can't speak for other periods. Um, but um, anyway, um, I'm pretty sure that none of the people um, through Southern Song had any idea of modern academic disciplines. Um, uh, they were many things at once, um, and if we're researching them, uh, we should not put them into modern academic boxes. So um, I have a plan for today's talk. Uh, what has changed recently in academia, uh, uh, necessitating a rethinking? Um, what's the purpose of your research? Um, and actually, it's amazing how many people do not <laughs> think of what is the purpose um, of their research. Um, then I'm going to talk about context, context, context. I am a historian, um, and um, I do think in any academic discipline, um, that's what it takes. Um, that's what methods are really about. Um, and lastly, how to frame a project when time is limited, i.e. nearly all the time. When we're in, in, uh, as senior academics invited to a conference, we never have enough time. Um, certainly students in the semester never have enough time. So I put this in big letters because I really uh, feel this. Um, so I was shouting at myself. I see disturbing trends in scholarship. Um, for a long time, once we got chant database, I was seeing way too many simple word searches um, rather than an emphasis on concept clusters, what words go together, um, how are they used. Um, most recently, I've seen an over-reliance on cell phones for research. <laughs> Um, which has simply stunned me. People are no longer bothering to go into a library. Um, and um, really, you're at a loss if you don't go into the library because you don't see the other books that you didn't expect um, to find. Um, and certainly, I've seen an avoidance of certain topics. To my astonishment, I was an outside member on an Oxford um, um, qualifying examinations, and um, uh, the student explained to me how everyone thought it was now wisest to pick the smallest possible topic um, to get through as expeditiously as possible. Um, I always thought of um, what I do is uh, for the long haul, um, and I think um, if you really do small topics and you never deviate from them, um, you may, in fact, get a job on your expertise in that small topic. But I, I, I believe, from what little I know, you will be a very unhappy academic camper. Um, what you need is a curiosity about um, many, many things. Um, because inevitably, when you're researching one topic, you are frustrated. Um, so I just was talking to Lubna El Amine in political science. She's a spectacular researcher. And she said, I'm so frustrated. I don't have time um, with the children. And, and I said, well, of course, you need to have five projects going or three projects going or at least more than one. Um, so that you could be doing the footnotes or the images uh, when you've got 20 minutes. Um, and then you're feeling as if you're making some advance. And in fact, you are making an advance. If I were to say what is today's ma main lesson, it is that counterintuitively what you see at first glance is not what you should aim to get. The story is never that simple. The past is a foreign country. And if you don't see how foreign it is, um, you are missing a great part of the picture. So I'm going to begin with my Bible um, as a historian and its historian's fallacies. Um, and actually, um, numbers one and two um, are the important things here. Never devise a research project based on the idea that you already know the answers to it, or you know how you need or want it to come out. 
Um, that is a fallacy, uh, the biggest fallacy he deals with. No interesting research um, ever comes out of that method and certainly no path breaking research. Um, um, but not even any solid research because you're just in an inner loop in your brain. Most importantly, and this is coming up more and more in the classroom and probably in research papers too, historians refuse to do origins and essences. Um, those are either metaphysical questions or they are propaganda driven. Um, historians instead, and I would say this is true for every other academic field, we focus instead on restoring a silhouette of the past, in Paul Vane's memorable phrase, um, to a specific time and place. Um, good historians don't think of simple causes. Uh, too many research projects are monocausal. Um, I've also been thinking very hard about a recent essay um, that was in the New York Times, and it's why culture has come to a standstill. Um, and I'm not sure I agree that culture has come to a standstill, but I read it with great interest um, because I do think modernity means a, res a relentless search for novelty. Um, and if I think of what sinological methods might mean to me, um, it's a goal of having non-novel excellence. <laughs> that has been the goal for most of human history, um, for, our, for scholars and artists, for anyone um, who is thinking, um, piecing together uh, different um, aspects uh, from the past, um, into um, an interesting um, non-novel uh, picture. Um, I, of course, include here Chinese painting as one of the best examples of non-novel excellence. Part two is what's the purpose of research and what questions drive you? Um, when I'm telling students um, how to prepare for PhD applications, um, I ask them to think what questions drive them. And by and large, they don't have a clue. They think in terms of topics. Okay, I, I want to work on this book or I want to work in this period. Um, but they're not thinking about why they want to work there. Um, and I think it's exceedingly important for all of us from the undergraduate level on uh, to be thinking about what are the characteristic questions that drive you. Um, it may be one big one. It could be lots of them. Um, in preparing for a class of mine, I was thinking about the stages that Westerners went through um, as they were showing an interest in Asian religion, philosophy, and history. Um, and in the colonial period, they wanted to learn about them, i.e. those people over there, uh, those others with a capital O, um, so as to better manage, categorize, um, or construe them. Um, that yielded to what I call, because I'm in California, the California moment um, when um, many moderns um, uh, choose bits and pieces uh, that they think they can use um, um, in their own lives um, uh, to get them um, through uh, their daily lives. So an, an example I used was meditation techniques, um, which came to California early, um, but didn't come with all the other practices that support those meditation practices. Um, so meditation is very popular in China, um, in California, almost everyone does it. Um, but that doesn't mean they bring the notion of practices um, into their daily life. Um, I myself am aiming for um, a different kind of learning, um, which is I'm hoping that I'll have a transformative experience inspired by learning through them. Um, and what that 
means is that they have to get under my skin um, in fairly substantial ways so that their voice is in my head. It doesn't mean I get back to the beginning. Um, we all have as obstacles certain presuppositions with what some people call four structures of knowledge. Um, but I think, again, we should be very aware which stage we are in. Um, and I think um, it's a mistake to think that you can begin by anything other than stage one, accumulating um, uh, data, as it were, um, about the subject you're interested in. I'm a big fan of Sheldon Pollock, who's a Sanskritist. Um, and what he argued um, in relation to his classic, and I think it works beautifully for ours, um, is that there are three levels of meaning for any classic. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about oral or written, we're talking about any text that has authority. Um, is the meaning the author or compiler intended within the original textual community to whom it was addressed. Um, I think it's absent archaeological evidence, impossible to get that meaning. Um, but we can certainly do meanings two and three, the meaning or meanings it acquired over time down through traditions, that's almost always plural, and we call that reception history. We're looking specifically at a specific time. What did this appear to mean um, to people at the time? Um, and then there's the meaning that it holds for people today, and that is almost always um, extremely different uh, from meanings one or two. Um, and um, I, I get a lot in my classroom, we Chinese believe, um, and I'm always puzzled by that um, because I've never seen Chinese as uh, thinking um, uh, all alike. Um, but there are imperatives sometimes for what we believe about ourselves as ethnicities, and this complicates the reception of any modern text. Um, in a way, I'll be talking about uh, this context, context, context uh, for lots of uh, slides from now. Um, but deciding the proper context in which to analyze a text or artifact depends upon being self-conscious about the reason one has chosen that text or artifact for study. I'll get into that in a minute uh, to give you an example of what I mean. Um, with intertextuality, determining how to determine the presence or shape of intertextuality changes, sometimes quite dramatically, depending on one's goals and research. Rule number three is all contexts, if carefully researched, shed light on aspects of the text or artifact. So um, as long as one knows what uh, questions are driving oneself, one shouldn't worry that one isn't addressing other aspects of the problem. Um, one should go um, context by context. I was reading a paper of a dear friend and co-author sometime with me, and he was talking about an 1126 edict um, um, from the Song Dynasty, obviously. Um, and he talked about the different ways that one could um, conceive, um, conceivably treat this edict. And part of that would be a much larger narrative with more substantive claims, revisionist or not, um, in which case one would look for similar rhetoric in other documents derived from other times, places, and genres, perhaps. Um, you could also do a dive down into a particular time and place, um, in which case one would assess the edict in its precise historical context um, as attesting to reigning or warring cultural presuppositions. Um, even with number two, there's some difficulties because ascertaining what is the precise cultural context, does it mean that year, that decade, 
um, that century, um, uh, all of that is far from easy. In any case, uh, one can also engage in an inquiry into that single type of document. I'm now going to just say what I think is the major problem with early or middle period China studies. Researchers find it hard to realize, uh, just as the Roman Empire is not Italy, everything we do in early through middle period, and I'm including Song in that, this is China before China. One must ascertain the likelihood and a minimum that certain texts and artifacts participated in a single cultural conversation. Frequently, they did not. Um, I think that's extremely difficult for us to keep in mind. Um, we tend to assume if a text or artifact was produced in China, um, it must have been produced from the same community, i.e. China. But in fact, what we know is extremely small textual and artifactual communities um, who often did not cooperate with each other um, um, in, in any or in substantive ways. Um, that leads to my own approach to the evidence. Every piece of writing, like every artifact, is to be treated as an archeological test core. Now, those of you who didn't train in archeology, span and I did for a year at the Institute of Archeology span in China, an archeological test core is something you see, you drill down um, and pull the core of earth out with everything in that core of earth in it, and then begin to see does it seem likely that we should engage in further excavation? Um, and the astonishing thing about the test core is that everything, and we should have known this from Michel Foucault anyway, everything, all evidence is equally valuable, but perhaps the most valuable evidence is the unexpected as an entry into a foreign pa uh, past. All evidence is necessarily partial. Um, you can take a test score from one area and you have no idea what the test score a foot away will contain. Um, and so what you must do is test score by test score by test score. Slowly you build up a sense of the site. Slowly you build up a sense of the time. Um, all evidence must be correlated with specific times and places wherever possible. This is my main objection um, to the growing corpus of um, found material um, and people confusing them with scientifically excavated texts. Um, I think there's genuine material in them. It's just, it's very difficult to know which parts are genuine and which not. But above all, however one deals um, with found versus um, received or excavated materials, one must avoid sweeping statements and statistics. And Mariana asked me um, to talk about statistics. Um, those of us who've done any work on bibliography for the Han period know that in certain genres, we probably have one one thousandth of the pieces that once existed in other genres. Oh, we guesstimate one in 100, one in 200. That means that the statistics are pretty much valueless. Uh, they look scientific, um, one can certainly say, as I have repeatedly say, judging from the extant evidence, um, it seems that um, um, a certain discourse is in place, um, but really statistical analysis um, is a snare and a delusion, and no one who really knows how to use statistics um, would go there. Um, I want to talk about vocabulary. 
Um, and here are two books that probably most of you have not ever heard of. The first one is Raymond Williams. Um, and what Raymond Williams uh, convinces us of, uh, because he did such a careful work of excavation here, um, is that nearly all of the words that we use today, including culture and society, um, um, including class, including dialectic, including <laughs> behavior, all of this, um, even tradition, um, these are our, our almost entirely of early modern construction. And they were required um, to build the simplified narratives um, that early modern states wanted to give of their own past. So over and over again, you look up a word you're about to use in Raymond Williams and you go, uh-oh, should I be using that word? And I can give you a good um, example um, or several, but um, let me get to that maybe in question and answers. Um, but The Realness of Things Past um, is a book that takes Raymond Williams seriously and shows concept by concept the economy, um, political life, religion, all of these terms do not actually fit um, the ancient Greek picture. I think that the work of Michael Lowy and myself has been trying against the odds um, to say how often our early modern constructions um, do not uh, fit um, and um, the distant past. And if we're going to actually learn about the distant past, we're going to have to pay attention to the categories they used uh, before we pay attention to can we or can we not shove this into um, our modern categories. Um, larger issues, um, seeing our own cultural presumptions. I just put on a few books that have influenced me in life. Um, but I, I actually think as academics, we don't spend enough time reflecting on our profession. And if we don't do that, we don't sometimes know that language that comes um, over up over and over again, well, that came up for the first time in 1985. Um, agency, for example, is, um, if I remember correctly, um, is something that comes up in 1985. And, and most of us use it. Uh, I try not to. I never know what it means. Therefore, I try not to use it. Uh, but that's just an example of words that have very recent histories. And so we should think, what are the presuppositions we have by saying that's such an important topic for us? Uh, was it an important topic for the people whom we research? I want to particularly call out Li Zaho's Lun Yu Jindu, um, because um, this has had a dramatic effect. And those of you who don't know it, you should at least leaf through it. Um, because what he gives you is um, to the degree it can be reconstructed in one layer, clearly labeled as Han, the Han commentaries, the Wei Jin, Nanbei Chao, the Song, the Ming, the Qing, the Republican era, and um, finally his own. Um, when you see how differently a book like the Lun Yu has been read over the centuries, um, then you get a strong sense that our major task is ascertaining which stratum we actually want to be researching when we're researching a classic book. Um, vocabulary. Never assume that you know your key vocabulary. <laughs> um, I have to say it took me nearly six years uh, to be sure that in the text I focused on, which were through um, uh, Zhang Guo, through Northern Song, um, these terms in almost every text, um, you're never going to get linguistic um, by Finger by 100% uh, language is living. 
um, and so recombinant. Um, but it took me nearly six years um, to say that um, it's long-term pleasure, absolutely not joy or happiness. Those of you who haven't looked up happiness in your dictionary uh, don't know that for most of the history, that word means luck. Um, and what these people are telling you is how to make long-term pleasure and not rely on luck. Um, there's short-term delight, and then there's gratification. Um, I guess my own method when I'm researching a text is to begin by making a glossary. Um, and I'm continually revising that glossary. Um, and for the moment, the most crucial terms I leave completely untranslated. Um, there are other methods to do this. Um, many people uh, would begin at the beginning in Shang Dynasty. I tend not to think. I know that Han Dynasty thinkers didn't know about Shang Dynasty oracle bones, but nonetheless, that can be quite illuminating, as in one of my students, uh, a visiting scholar, sorry, his paper was on what does Jing normally translated as reverence mean. I could tell from working on the documents that reverence and respect does not work in the context, judging from my commentaries to the um, documents. Um, so I came up with something like doing one's uh, duty uh, attentively. Um, but what he showed is uh, there's likely always this sense of mu, of tending as a shepherd um, to the vocabulary. Um, I always go to early Chinese texts. Um, I think it's a quite conservative analysis. I would, for example, place the Zhuozhuan much later than early Chinese text does. But still, you want to see how other people have dated the texts you're working on. Um, we don't have to go through this, um, but this is typically what I do um, and typically how I begin um, researching, let's say, the word regret. Okay, um, uh, so the file that was regret down and dirty went through all of the cases in all the pre-Han and Han, just so I could lay them out and see what are the objects of regret, in what context does it crop up, um, what are its antonyms. Um, Manuscript culture. Joe McDermott showed us that manuscript culture lasts well into the Ming form in many contexts and settings. Um, so um, formatting also guides our reading. Um, I applaud, though I hate those big books. I wish they were smaller in size. The decision by the Chinese uh, to publish um, the strips so that we can see the originals um, in their original size um, because formatting uh, guides are reading always. Um, I was trained to read classical Chinese with no punctuation. Um, and the first thing I do when I'm reading is I tend to take the punctuation out. Um, anyway, small clues, if you're paying attention to manuscript culture can yield big results. Most Zhangguo masterworks, so-called Zhangguo masterworks, were completely re-edited in late Western Han. And we know that thanks to Liu Sheng. Um, so um, how to frame a topic when there is limited time? I would always urge everyone to go smaller, not bigger. To me, scholarship is like brickwork. One hopes to learn one single thing in order eventually to fit that knowledge into a larger project. Um, example, when one is interested in Buddhism, um, I tell my students, take one chapter in a single text, take one figure perhaps in history, take, and with Huinang, you'd have to take the reception of Huinang at a given time and place. Uh, so protein is as Huinang himself become, um, or one place at one time. Um, I think that's the end, and I think I'm more or less on time. Um, I think um, 
you know, I was brought up in the Mao Zedong era, or I first became interested in China um, when uh, Sino-US relations were incredibly bad under the Mao era, and I thought I needed to know something about this political other. Um, I myself know how to lay bricks. I've always thought uh, we should be less shy as academics about laying bricks for the future and less focused on thinking how important our own project is. Thanks. I think I'm out of there. Can I shop, stop sharing? I think yes. I could. Okay. Um, hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. What, what I will try to do in the next time is give specific examples from um, my own research to show you what I think about um, undertaking research. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? This may be too simple, but I thought it might be useful to go. Yeah, simple. I, I must uh, admit my connection is a bit choppy, so I must apologize very much if I uh, don't moderate the session quite as well as I could, but I, I the problem is probably on my side. I hope you can manage. Uh, mm. So the floor is open for discussions. Uh, thank you for your questions. You may either type them into the chat. If you don't want to be on the video taping, then you can uh, just type, please read out into the chat and we will do our best to read your question out. And of course, you can also, if you ask a question, you can raise your hand by the icon and then you can switch on your camera, switch on your microphone and ask away. I think Josh had a question already. Very simple. Um, I'd, I'd ask just ask you to clarify something. Uh, yes, we already one. have a few questions. Oh, could uh, Josh? The first one I'm I sorry. saw was from Tao Jiang. Um, Would you like to ask? Doesn't... Um, no, uh, Josh, will you, why, why don't you go first? You already started. My, mine is very simple. Um, you, you said, um, and you, you concluded again with this, Michael, um, to go small, right? Uh, understood completely. But then you said, um, you know, with, when you're doing a dissertation and you're heading towards the job market, don't go small because you don't want to be confined to a box that you'll, you know, be with. Could just just clarify for the purposes of what you what yes. your main points were. I probably did that too quickly, so thanks for asking for clarification. What I meant, um, I don't think of dissertations as small. Um, I don't think of them as so time limited. After all, people routinely spend three or four years um, on them. But I think they all begin in rather small ways um, with a book one loves or a question that is driving one. Um, and um, I realized um, quite recently, and you may be different, but I have never written a book in the sense of conceiving a book from the beginning. I have written one piece um, for example, the Chinese pleasure book began with a piece in honor of Michael Lowy, um, who couldn't be less interested in the topic of pleasure, but I wanted to have the punchline at the end about how much pleasure his teaching has given me. Um, you couldn't have gone smaller in a way. I went to one book. Um, it turned out to have a lot more in it than I thought it would have, Schwinza, but um, I think that at least my books are all composed of, of really separate units. Um, and those units um, have frequently been driven by a single insight. Um, so the single insight, which absolutely none of the reviewers of the pleasure book focused on was I would like us to use new vocabulary. So they could be glowing reviews, but they kept on talking about happiness and joy. <laughs> they missed the whole point. Um, anyway, um, such are reviews, you know. But what I mean by this is we've seen how easy it is to get hired by a big idea. And in fact, in America, there's a recent controversy about this. 
Um, and I'm not going to go into the controversy, but you know it and I know it. Um, and it was simply uh, taking a big idea, um, insufficiently researched. Um, and now this has become a, a real brick around someone's neck. Um, and um, so uh, what I think I mean by this is um, I'm looking back at my own thesis my own thesis was on a single book. It was really driven by a single chapter in that single book, and that was on Guishan, um, on ghosts and um, gods. Um, and um, uh, that was Feng Su Tong Yi. I am still working out problems that I couldn't work out for that dissertation <laughs> that I was alerted to by the fact <laughs> Um, that I really didn't have answers. Um, what is custom? Does it change its meaning over time? As simple a thing as that, um, which is phenomenally hard um, to research. So why I'm doing local communities in some sense is I'm getting back to the question of um, custom and locality, um, because Ying Xiao's book is written to his fellow people in Runan, and that's clear. Nearly all of his examples are fellow Runanese um, people. So um, I think um, what I mean by that is don't go for China. Don't go for, I mean, it's one thing in 1911 to go for China. It's maybe one thing after 1840 um, to go for China. Um, or, or one could make separate cases for different dates um, in late imperial China. But um, what I think one should do is think about the specific questions, how best, what kind of evidence and artifact, um, including artifacts, would answer those uh, questions, would likely tell me something about my preoccupations. Um, and my preoccupations were, in doing the thesis, um, getting behind the surface of the administrative political world um, to what were people's fears and anxieties and what did they project on the unseen world. Um, so um, that's where I was trying to get to. So I think um, I'm... I'm not a fan of micro histories that say nothing or rigorously say, oh, this has nothing to do with any larger picture. We write because our questions are larger, um, but um, we need lots of micro histories um, to build up a coherent picture. Um, and um, deciding what is a micro history um, at this point is is pretty hard to decide, <laughs> but um, not talking about China as a whole, I think, um, for the period I work in. I don't know whether that clarified anything, but anyway. <laughs> Tao. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's actually very helpful to me, you know, who's not a historian, as you know, uh, but uh, but I, I think we, you know, we, we there are a lot of things that we share. Uh, I have just a quick question about the, the, the comment at the very beginning that you said you would have given a different talk five years ago. I wonder what has changed in the last five years, what has prompted the change, whether that's, you know, I want to see where, where the, you know, how, how this has shaped the way that you're approaching things at this moment. I I think it's partly by being confronted with so much bad work. Um, and um, um, a friend of mine, it's not just, it's in no sphere, the Sinosphere or Euro-America or whatever. Um, and what I mean by bad work is this, um, it's an accumulation of data um, to which no thought has been given about why one is gathering data. Um, in other words, um, one has gone small in a particular way. One has gone safe rather than 
um, small in the way I'm trying to use that. Um, and um, certainly in your work, uh, you go small in the sense of one chapter per person <laughs> that you are thinking about. Um, but um, you don't go safe. In other words, in our heads, we are thinking about larger questions. Um, that's why we have decided to spend the time with a particular text or a particular era or a particular artifact. A minute. Yeah. Um, I think it's incredibly important somewhere in published work um, to tell people what one's preoccupations are. Um, it can be in the final conclusion. Um, the implications of this are potentially large, <laughs> something like that. Um, but I think it is extremely important to tell people where you're coming from um, as an act of academic honesty, what has been in the back of your head. Um, not everyone would agree to that. Um, I was trained, do not put yourself in the picture. And gradually, I have more and more put myself in the picture. I was also trained to construct a narrative that is uh, stone-faced um, and what I would call um, um, uh, the overview uh, narrative, which allows no counter narrative to take place. More and more, and you're already there, um, I am allowing people to see in my work that other narratives could be constructed from my evidence. If I have um, carefully translated things, um, there are other narratives to be constructed. So what I have found oppressive um, and I found it um, more and more recently um, is people who think that only their narrative can hold um, and people, and, and I think there are more and more of them, but it may be that there are more of them in certain circles I travel in, um, that there is no other way to look at anything. Um, except through a one lens, I think there are multiple lenses and that's how we construct a silhouette of the past. So I think I've seen more bad work. I've seen more students saying, oh, I've researched the topic and then you see it's just been on their cell phone. Um, that is brand new to me. I could not have imagined that people could get to graduate school and be still operating that way. Um, and they haven't been stopped <laughs> long before then. Um, so it's partly the student population, partly what I'm reading, partly because I edit things, I often see other reports that other people compile about people's work. Um, and and some of them, I think, are have shocked me to the core, um, that they simply don't take the person on the basis the person has announced they wish to be taken. <laughs> um, they really want the person to do another project, a project they themselves haven't done, but think should be done, and now is the time to vent. So I think um, I'm hoping um, to, in my own work, um, be a model of greater generosity um, um, to the field as a whole, uh, both in that I'm giving people the evidence to tear me apart um, if they have better ed evidence. Um, and I'm spending a lot of time doing that. Um, I try to give the best evidence I can but you know, sometimes, uh, and I have said in my own work in footnotes, I said this in my earlier work, this now turns out to be wrong. Um, and I think we need to do that a bit more than we're doing it in the field um, lately. <laughs> Thanks.
Should I call Marco or should you? Mm. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Because something on my computer crashed and now I can hear you. I can't really see you, I must confess, but okay. I, I, it's it's a pleasure to be hearing you. Well, I, <laughs> I, I see two, uh, two voices as it stands. The first one is from Karen Turner. Thank you very much for this. I have several questions. I'll keep it to one. And that is the over romanticization of certain cultural formative, formative cultural uh, relics. And that is the love of the Confucians that so many, I have to say, of the older men in our field have called upon and have rejected alternative explanations. And so romanticizing the past, and I think part of this comes out of a deep desire to return to a better age after the Cold War and so on, an age of sage kings, so that some people identified with these sage kings and are very reluctant to hear an alternative because it's very personal. So I, I wonder what you have to say about that. The second one, if there's time, is the issue of comparative history and what we can learn from comparative history or not. Thank, Thank you. you. Those are great questions. Um, I'm going to speak honestly and off the cuff. Um, I was asked to do two lectures, um, the Yu Yingshi lectures um, in Hong Kong. And I chose as my topic, and really I, I chose it almost in choosing it with a heavy heart. <clears throat> what I wanted to take on, I had just read uh, Yu Yingshi's 1,200 pages um, about um, Jushi and his era. And um, what I felt is I gained a tremendous amount of knowledge uh, from reading and taking notes on those 1,200 pages. What I felt, however, was that all of Yu Yingshu's project, and I just mentioned him because I've, he is, would be a cultural icon who could not let this go. Um, um, I think we should not, besides personal identification, we should not discount the very real understanding that Yu Yingshu had that this would gain him many adherents. Because what he really did in his work, and to prepare for these lectures, I read every single piece I could get my hands on. He was a voluminous writer that took six months just to read all that stuff. Um, 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 and what I found was he was using exactly the same argument, saying, you too, a modern merchant or CEO are a Wenren. You are today's equivalent to the Song Dynasty man of letters. He said that to politicians. He said it to one academics. He said it to all males. Um, and, and it was very much a male crowd. So um, I'm with you, um, but I think what one also has to realize is the immense satisfaction one gets uh, from all this adulation from people who have now been labeled uh, men of letters themselves, Wenren. Um, and to my mind, I go, okay, compose me a poem spontaneously. Compo you know, weigh in on this problem um, before a statesman. I'm sorry, I take um, Wenren uh, very seriously because I've worked on a few of them, including Sushur. So um, the next thing about doing comparative history, um, and here again, I'm going to speak off the cuff. I have, as one of my favorite colleagues, um, a Roman historian, and I just read a piece by him that I thought was terrible. It was terrible because he tried, unlike everyone else in the volume, to make a Rome-China comparison. I was out of town at the time he was doing this. Normally we read each other's papers and I say, no, read this, and, you know, no, think about this. Um, anyway, um, that wasn't happening. And I think he made a 
an in faith good effort um, to look at China. And he basically concluded that there were no local organizations. Well, those of us who work on early China can name lots of local organizations, um, including something called either a Dan or a Shan, <laughs> and uh, which is specifically a local organization with specific functions. And we find it everywhere in our texts. And for those of you who don't know about that, Liu Zhenggui with uh, uh, Du Zhengsheng has written an excellent book called Gu Dai, Shama Shama Shui. <laughs> Can't remember. I don't think Jungle, but maybe it's um, uh, in there. Um, and uh, Liu Zhengui um, is uh, the first author on that book. Um, and they are rethinking what um, both of them had done in their earlier work. So um, there are two essays in there about this Dan R. Shan. Um, uh, so anyway, I think the problem with doing comparative history is, okay, in Chang'an 26 BCE, I have quite a bit about Rome um, in the forward and in the afterward. In order to do that, I actually retook Latin, okay? I'd had um, Latin in high school in the first years of college. Uh, I retook Latin with a tutor. Um, so that I could at least follow in the Loeb classics uh, and um, my tutor became my advisor. What do I read if I want to know about this? Um, if you don't have another counterpart who can, um, if the counterpart culture, um, you don't have another person to consult on all of that and then to read your work, um, I think it's really dangerous because the work that's out there on especially early China, but also middle period China, um, is now um, work that is done, uh, very good work done 20 years ago, is now completely out of date, as you yourself know, um, thanks to uh, found and excavated materials and lots of tombs. So um, I think as a human being, one cannot but think comparatively. In other words, I think in English, um, I read a lot of outside scholarship to help me devise questions I'm going to bring to my materials. So I think comparatively, but I'm nervous about being comparative. Um, and I um, have done it um, overtly, I think only twice in Chang'an 26 BCE, and once in a tongue-in-cheek article um, suggesting that Schwinze, that Aristotle be called um, the Greek Schwinza, because Schwinza is so much better than Aristotle. Um, anyway, my Aristotle friends were outraged, but um, anyway, they did me the favor of reading my drafts, and, um, and I wouldn't have dared to do it without knowing I had three or four Aristotle fans who would comb through that text uh, for errors. So um, we need to, one reason I recommend Raymond Williams is we need to be aware that the vocabulary we think in is already a distorting lens. Um, and um, that will uh, drive us to do better work. But above all, the problem with comparative history still um, is that um, the comparison is always to a, a rosy picture of Western modern society um, and then the lack in China of a direct counterpart. Um, Carolyn Bynum, if you don't know it, wrote a brilliant piece on why a procession in India is not the same as a Catholic procession in 12th century France. Um, and I say brilliant because again, this is a case where you go, okay, procession, procession, religion, religion, why wouldn't this be the same? Um, and she shows quite plainly that those two things are not, those are apples and oranges. 
Um, I really recommend uh, Bruce Lincoln's work entitled Apples and Oranges. Um, I found it illuminating. Um, so I was trained by Nathan Sivan um, um, and um, to be a comparativist, but to bring to the forefront the fact I'm always comparing. Um, and maybe that's one of the things I need to have up and out front, out in front. Um, so, uh, yeah, I find myself doing that more and more and having less and less patience um, with uh, the kind of people who write as if this is the only story that can be told. Hope that helps. So nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. Over to Henry Jacobson. Uh, thank you. Professor Nyan, thank you for this talk, firstly. Um, I wanted to pick up on one of the things uh, you mentioned, which is, um, I think for uh, a lot of PhD and young scholars such as myself, we we do see um, you know many of these big big ideas um, sort of entering into uh, the job market in particular. Um, there are certain kind of uh, publishing pressures that we're under today that I think were different um, in the past. And I just wondered, you know, do you have any advice on sort of how to resist this um, this perhaps trend towards these big marketable sort of theses, um, because I, I suppose I've often seen sort of um, publicly many of these ideas praised, but then in, in private, um, speaking with scholars, they will express their concerns about um, these okay. kind of particular ideas. That is a great yeah. question, and I struggle with it with my own students. Okay, first of all, I'd like you to understand that I don't believe the publication world is substantially different now than it was when I started. Um, I am still, as a senior scholar, of course, my name is taken off of it, um, having to go through the same hurdles. Um, and um, I, as a frequent reviewer of first books for authors, um, am, am frequently in lots of conversations with publishers about what they want um, and where it's going. So I think what publishers want is not necessarily a big idea. What they want is um, something solid. <laughs> they don't want to be embarrassed that they published it. But I think your question is um, targeted in a sense a bit differently. Um, and it is, how do you sell yourself on the job market? Okay. Um, first of all, I think it's incredibly important um, that you get to know people outside your own uh, university department. Um, every single one of my students has people recommending them who are not in China studies and who are not um, in UC Berkeley. I insist upon people getting to know people outside their own sphere um, and interacting with them rather more substantially. This is a feature that the Berkeley History Department insists upon, and I think it's one of the best things we insist upon. Um, because having three letters from close uh, faculty in your own department saying you are fabulous means nothing. Um, and the trouble is uh, that we know people, and I won't name names, who write about every single student they've got. This is the best student I've ever taught in 20 years. So these letters mean substantially nothing, and you need to go outside the field. Um, I don't know what you call a big or a small idea, but Trenton Wilson just got hired at Princeton on um, the basis of saying um, in late Eastern Han into the Weijin period, um, there are two warring rhetorics um, having to do with uh, what is uh, good about amnesties or what is bad about amnesties. And clearly all these people are Ru. Um, it's within that group. Um, that was a hard one. <laughs> 
uh, conclusion. He had to do masses of work uh, to get there, but it's not a particularly big story. It's a story simply that things are more complicated than we thought. So often selling yourself on the job market consists of two things. First of all, when you go for an interview, what people are really looking at, if you've come from a good place, a good place, meaning a place with well-established teachers, um, they assume you know your stuff. They're not looking so much about that. They may not even have a single person on the search committee in your precise field. Um, instead, they're looking for what kind of a colleague you would be. So the point of engaging outside your field um, is having things to talk with them, um, as well as having some things in your head um, as you're going through arguments. So um, they're looking for colleagues um, more than they're looking for scholars in that interview. Um, but often what a big enough idea is about is there is a standard narrative, Rue equals this, um, and this is just adding one more piece uh, to that information. Um, but um, Trenton began life by telling me he wanted to work on Wang B. And I said, oh, he's so derivative. <laughs> Why would you want to? <laughs> and Trenton said, you know, he's a genius, a boy genius. I've always been trained that way. Um, and, you know, by the end of the dissertation, he's still interested in Wang Bi, but now as, as a, a derivative thinker um, who became enormously influential, partly because of this debate. Okay. So I think maybe our way of framing big and small um, is different. That said, um, expectations are different. Um, when I did my dissertation, I was told um, that you're a woman working in a non-existent field, you will not get a job. Just work on something you like working on. So I chose the topic um, and I just worked on it. Um, your generation expects to get jobs in a very varied um, landscape. Um, in America, at least, um, and I didn't find this out, my colleague in modern China found this out, there were more jobs in early China than there were in modern. Um, I would expect that the number in middle period is, is equally growing. So all job markets are functions of the current politics and what jobs have already been filled. Um, so um, there are very few places besides Berkeley that have four China historians. So um, anyway, there we are. Um, and that's not counting the people in EALC. So um, yeah, um, I both appreciate the differences and don't think those differences should drive you. As I tell my students at the undergraduate and graduate level, if you find something interesting, other people will find it interesting too. Um, I don't think um, the way to a career is as narrow um, as it is currently conceived by graduate students. Um, and um, I went to school mostly with people from Taiwan because of U.S. Sino-U.S. relations. They were all going back to jobs that had already been named for them in the history department at Taida or at Academia Sinica. Um, so um, it was all or nothing in that department. But I think what really convinces people that you have something worth pursuing is simply your own pleasure in the topic um, and your own ability to connect it to things that people outside the field want to hear about. I'll simply say that when I was hired at Berkeley, the first comment I got, and that was against the odds they had a favored candidate, um, uh, the first comment I got from a faculty member was, you're the first person who's talked in English. In other words, who I can understand what 
you're interested in. Um, so uh, we have to crawl out of our rabbit holes in periodic intervals. Um, and luckily, undergraduate teaching is great for that. But in graduate school, that is hard to do. So you need to get someone whom you regularly give your materials who is outside your field um, to read your materials to say, what just happened? I haven't a clue. Um, and even now, having been writing for 30 years, I always do that. And, and someone will say, on page five, you just walked off a cliff. You know, I'm... I think I've gone A, B, C, D, but I've gone A, B, D, and no one can figure out um, who is not in the field how that leap was made. Um, so um, that's the benefit of cultivating friends uh, with whom you exchange work. Um, and I do that quite regularly with people outside my field. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that helps. Um, this is an anxious generation. Um, and it's an interesting question, why so anxious? Um, when I got my PhD, there were two jobs in China for any field in America. I mean, I think there's always reason for anxiety. Um, but our anxiety should not drive us our curiosity should be driving us. And I know that takes an effort and that's my practice because I'm a worrier. So um, getting myself out of that zone of just free floating anxiety um, is my practice, yeah. And I know I'll make mistakes, so what? And I know some people won't like me, so what? <laughs> so, um, it's rarely a make or break situation. So that is very <laughs> relieving to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and I also think this would be an ideal conclusion if there aren't any other questions that I have overseen. Corrine, well, surely you have something. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Hello. <clears throat> You know, it took me it took me more than half an hour to get into this Zoom meeting. So I think I'm afraid I missed most of you. <laughs> most of it. <laughs> yes. so, I'm happy to see you. Yes, we'll so leave it at that. Yes. <laughs> but Ting Nian has, has a question. Uh, can I speak now? Yes, please. I'm happy Karen is also here. Um, I actually always want to have an opportunity to have this conversation with you and other sinologists because, as you know, my sinological background, uh, I was trained by Karen, and I'm always aware of the danger of trying to restore the original meaning. Uh, by original meaning, I mean the meaning intended by the author. But... My question would be, what if my curiosity is really about what might be the intended meaning of the people who compose the text? I, then I, what I, kind of evidence you would suggest me to consider? Okay, um, I have thoughts about this because I've thought about it a lot because I want to know what was in the minds of the people I'm reading. To me, that's the most interesting question, especially when they don't think like me um, or don't appear. I, say, I said stage one is almost unrecoverable, um, but I can be certain, and what I see in philosophy all too often um, um, is focusing on a single vocabulary word or a single phrase. Um, there is no way you can reconstruct meaning um, by single words. Um, what one needs, and Henry Rosemont taught me this, um, would be something like concept clusters. There's no text that's come to us 
Um, even excavated texts we're finding have a myriad of problems with them. I'm reading in a reading group with in Bern, Switzerland, uh, Gordian, uh, the Wuxing manuscript. Um, and we're continually confronted. Is this graph miswritten? Um, how much can we uh, trust our own judgment on all of these things? Um, and I was trained very firmly by someone Kareem know, knew well, um, Paul Soroy's. And Paul Soroy said two things. What's in the text is what you need to stay with first. Okay. Um, meaning there are other people, and I'm learning so much from my fellow readers in Switzerland, but there are plenty of other people who say, oh, this reminds me of the Analex line, blah, 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 blah. Well, as far as we know, the Analex was not composed or not compiled, bits and pieces, certainly, but those traditions are quite variable until it becomes a more or less fixed text in Western Han. So how can we say in Gordian that it's appropriate to go there first in terms of interpretation? Um, on the other hand, if you look at the distinctive vocabulary that's in a um, single text, um, sometimes even that is vocabulary is confusing. Um, but if you start to compile a glossary of and which concepts tend to occur in proximity um, with that vocabulary, um, then I think you have at least a better chance given the fact of activist editors in manuscript culture of getting at some kind of meaning um, in the text than you have when you go word for word. Um, I also have a huge objection, um, and I'm smiling here. Um, I have had so many talks with people saying, um, they say, oh, I'm just going to use this translation. And then I go, but that translation then already skews your analysis. There is no way we can translate everything de novo, but we really need to choose our translations carefully. It's my chief objection against Christoph Harbsmeyer's uh, database. Um, in many ways, that's wonderful. In that respect, it's terrible um, because he just put up any translation willy-nilly that existed. Some are good, some are bad. Um, you need to know what translations exist. You need to not take the last translation. And you need, I would argue, to not move across commentarial traditions, as is often done, unless with a particular text, your research is stratum by stratum. Okay, unless that's your project, then you can move um, to different commentaries. Um, but you should not just pick and choose. I'm against picking and choosing willy nilly, you know, without thought. I think most of the thought of the project has to come early on. Um, and um, in the selection of the text, in the acknowledgments of the questions that drive you, of a devising of a glossary, which you will then amend as you get to know the text better. Um, and um, I think that what I see far too often is, oh, this was just available online. So I'm using that translation. Um, or this just came out and I haven't read it yet, so now I'm using this translation. <laughs> I mean, it's that is crazy. Uh, that is not scholarship. That is just sloppy work. Um, so anyway, um, I think um, there is no word that a single word that we can rely upon as reliable in the text we're reading. So if the word comes up over and over and over again, yes, then um, one can begin to build up a corpus of meaning 
but um, otherwise, um, I think we've got a problem. Yeah. May I ask another question? I would love it. It's such a good question you're asking. What if if I consider my task because I have so many conversations, you, you know that I'm affi always affiliated with philosophy departments. And so I have so many conversations with uh, scholars in Chinese philosophy. Right. So some of them would say that, okay, I know that it's difficult to claim or to argue that this is the intended meaning by the author or the editor of the text. But my work or my my task is to argue that if this particular interpretation of the text is valid, mm -hmm. then the implications of this interpretation can be this and that. Do you consider this kind of um, professional or this kind of academic discourse is valid? Um, actually, I do. Um, that would be stage three. What does the text mean to us today? I'm just not interested in doing stage three um, <laughs> so much. Um, I'm aware of what the standard narratives about anything I work upon is. I'm more interested in seeing do the standard narratives hold? Um, because I, like you, am interested in seeing people think differently from myself, whereas stage three is often an endless feedback loop. Um, so there's a very interesting set of discussions. Uh, there was an op-ed, What is Philosophy Good For?, I think is the title. Um, recently in the New York Times, and I think um, uh, really um, it reminded me um, that one reason I'm not a philosopher is I am so uninterested in many of the problems that are still being discussed 50, 60, mm -hmm. 70 years on, like the trolley problem. Um, mm -hmm. I went to a Berkeley ethics <laughs> class and I had to walk out it's just mind numbing. Um, so anyway, um, I think um, um, I would prefer not to say this research is invalid. Um, I would re re prefer to say, how do I make my own research um, mm -hmm. evidence-based mm -hmm. to the degree that it's possible? Um, mm -hmm. So um, clearly, I have in my mind people I like or dislike, <laughs> but I don't want to be driven by that. Um, and I'm in a history department where many people think to this day, China has no history. And it really doesn't oh. matter how many talks the China historians give them. They yeah. simply, as Jack Goody would say, um, they prefer to be th thieves of history. So um, anyway, they prefer to say everything started with their country, whatever their country mm -hmm. is. Um, and so I find it particularly tedious when people in the China field want to make everything start with their period or this or that. Um, the reason I'm in an early China field is I started in modern politics. I was uh, um, in political philosophy um, um, and politics, um, and I just went steadily backwards because the more I read, the more I thought, well, my Northern Song guys, 11th century, I got very interested in. Well, they're all quoting people in the Han. I guess I better know something about the Han. Um, so I don't think any type of scholarship, we're going to have our likes and dislikes, but I would prefer not to get into rights or wrongs or valid or invalid. Mm. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, of course. I ask this question as because actually I encounter this kind of um, situation quite often. For example, when I'm evaluating an essay or evaluating an application, and some of the philosophy colleagues would say, this is not so philosophical. And of course, given my sinological background, I would say, okay, but I can still see the value 
of this kind well, of project? Um, I understand that most of the philosophy departments in the US, including that at Berkeley, are substantially populated um, by continental uh, philosophers who are basically doing linguistic analysis and that's what they think. I think the single best thing for you to read is one of two books on the women philosophers at Oxford. Um, mm -hmm. And one of them has got a title like something, what are the women thinking? But you'll you'll find these books um, very easily by looking up the four philosophers that both these books uh, focus on. Um, uh, it is Iris Murdoch, who later became um, a, a novelist, of course, but began as a philosopher. Um, it would be um, Elizabeth Anscombe, it would be Philippa Foote, and it would be Mary Midgley. They were all told they were not philosophers, okay? <laughs> These are four women who have substantially changed the face of philosophy, but not mm -hmm. for a certain group of philosophers, um, who cannot get out of a series of problems that even if they read Bernard Williams seriously, they ought to be getting out of. So mm -hmm. I think what our colleagues, um, I, I think we had better ignore people who try and typecast us in an academic silo. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you have a good argument, you will be eventually judged by people um, who understand the value of your work. Um, so try for the moment to just ascertain how to frame the issue. By the way, I'm very worried. Um, I have the latest thing I've worked on with a co-author um, is on the environment. Um, and there's very little environmental philosophy um, and the first chapter is on the intractability of Anglo-American law when it comes to certain kinds of problems. Um, some people will say that's not philosophy. That's um, legal something. Um, so it doesn't stop. Uh, when I wrote the Chinese Pleasure Book, Every single first talk I gave, someone stood up and said, this is a topic unserious and unworthy of an academic. Oh. So you need to know that sometimes we need a bit of guts. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, whatever else one can say, um, I'm not sure if a human being has thought it um, that there is an unworthy topic of research. Mm -hmm. So there it is. Yeah. yeah, thank you for your answer and the reference to that wow. book. Ever read it? Thank you. Yes. yes, there are two of them and they're both good. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, and, and Mary Midgley, by the way, said, uh, when someone asked her, well, why do you think that there were four philosophers coming out of Oxford at that particular time, and the most famous four are all women? She said, because the men were away fighting in World War II. <laughs> and I think we need to realize that we women get bullied a bit more than we deserve. Um, and it's a fact of life, and it's not going away. Um, mm -hmm. So there it is. I hope in the next generations, but in my own department, I see people being socialized into bad behavior. Um, and so uh, we'll see. In other departments, I don't see that happening. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'd have to flip a coin as to I are we. Say to them, I'm hoping for the next gen generation, female yes. scholars would be bullied less. Me too. But since we already know in China that women are being encouraged um, to go home and have children and not be professional, as um, uh, you know, we'll have to see what the world is like. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. No, of course, I, I don't want to bully we anyone here. We have to quit. <laughs> yes, we have but to quit. Due to time constraints, I. Uh, mm -hmm. I would, uh, of course, uh, say that we have a lot to go and read up on right now. 
And fortunately, in case you have missed uh, some of these things, like I certainly have, and I can only apologize for connection issues, then you can go to the Methods in Synology website to uh, have another look at this session as it has been recorded. And should you then have any further questions or ideas, please do not hesitate to direct them at Methods in Synology via their email account or tweet us at in Synology. And furthermore, I am also pleased to announce that next week, Michael Nyland will be back for a second session entitled Synological Methods, Examples and Experiences. So keep your eyes peeled, make sure to join us again. And uh, thanks very much again for uh, the, uh, Michael Nyland for once, and also to the organizers of Methods and Synology. Uh, I may mention that all of these are volunteers. This is not a funded project. So they're doing this on their own account just for us to enjoy. And I, I hope you all enjoyed it, that, that you have a great week. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. I really was happy to see people and to hear their questions. Thank you.